This is a delight for me to welcome and introduce Linda Smith. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all. Our fifth Dean's Lecture for 2016. I acknowledge, acknowledge the elders, families and descendants of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of these lands for many generations. And I acknowledge that the land on which we meet today was a place of age-old ceremonies, of celebration, of initiation, and renewal, and that local Aboriginal peoples have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of this university. So tonight is a special night as we welcome our second international guest speaker for the year, Professor Linda Tuhiwai of the University Smith, of the, uh, sorry, Tuhiwai, Tuhiwai, I've got that right. I knew I'd struggle with this, Linda from the University of Waikato in New Zealand. Linda is the Pro Vice Chancellor of Māori and Professor of Education and Māori Development, as well as a former Dean of the School of Māori and Pacific Development. After completing her Bachelor of Arts History at the University of Auckland in 1975, Linda went on to complete a Diploma of Teaching and a Master of Education and then to her PhD. In 2002, she became the foundational co-director of the Māori Centre of Research Excellence, named Napai Ote Marama Tunga. Good? What a relief. And subsequently, the founding director of the Te Kor Tahi, Tahi Research Institute at the University of Waikato in 2010. Linda is an international expert in Indigenous education, health, and research methodologies, and has received a number of awards, including a New Zealand Honour of as the companion to the New Zealand Order of Merit for her contribution to Māori education. She is a fellow of the American Association for Educational Research and has served on many committees, including chairing the Māori Health Committee and the Māori Tertiary Reference Group. Linda's widely published. In particular, I note her international best-selling book, Decolonising Methodolog Methodologies, Research and in Indigenous Peoples, which was published in 1999. Tonight, Linda will share her reflections on the Māori educational experience in New Zealand, including lessons learned and the challenges. So at the end of the presentation, our Professor in Indigenous Education, Professor Liz McKinley, will lead Wai Ata and may be joined by friends. We shall see about that. So will you all now please join me in welcoming Linda. Uh, he may eat the Mona, he may eat it to wife, he may eat it to father, Fenua, or Tene Wai. Firstly, greetings to the land, greetings to the mountains, greetings to the waters, and greetings to the traditional peoples of this land. Thank you very much um, for having me. I'm going to do a very rare thing for me, and it's mostly. Stick to the text. <laughs> uh, normally I meander, but time is of the essence. And I do want to kind of reflect on the 30 years of my educational development from about the 1980s, but that was also 30 years in, almost of neoliberal, the neoliberal moment. And there's a story that I'm going to tell which is about both. Um, the development of Māori within the sort of neoliberal forms of New Zealand. Um, so just firstly, for those of you who may need reminding, my work as an Indigenous educator and researcher is situated in the interface of academic and Māori educational thoughts and practices and within the unequal power relations of a dominant settler state of New Zealand and an indigenous Māori society. The interpretation, negotiation and translation of ideas to the different communities who meet at the interface is a critical aspect of my work as an educator, as a researcher and as a member of more than one community. 
So I bring to this reflection of Māori experiences with education. My own history as someone who was a political activist of the 1970s, seeking recognition of the Treaty of Waitangi, who helped establish the alternative schooling system known as Kurakaupapa Māori that I'm going to talk about, and the alternative higher education institutions known as Wānanga, and also someone who served on various government advisory boards for both school and tertiary system reform, and more recently in health and social science research. My theoretical ideas about engagement between education systems and Indigenous peoples has been forged in years of ritualised enactments of a war of position, also known as meetings and hui, <laughs> where officials and institutions have fumbled with awkward good intentions and communities have turned up with a hopefulness shaded by cynicism and left with more or less the same feelings. Research and educational ideas have played a really complicated role in the search for better educational outcomes for Māori. Research, for example, based on eugenics, on a racial basis for intelligence, research that critiqued our child-rearing practices and family units, ideas about curriculum that limited our children to a manual curriculum and the use of our ha hands rather than our minds, social linguistics research that viewed our home languages and cultural knowledge as deficit, and pedagogical practices that mandated schools to destroy our language and cultural values, set our development back at least 100 years. Those ideas still haunt our educational landscape, despite many layers of school reform, new technologies, new ideas, and more recent research that has started to hone in on where the most difference can be made to improve the educational outcome for our students. Our experience also talks to the absence and the refusal of research to address the questions that Indigenous communities are asking of education. These questions focused on matters such as governance and the role of the Treaty of Waitangi in making educational decisions on language revitalisation, the role of extended families and communities in schools, the best ways to organise learning contexts for our children, and on, and on alternative ways to keep all our students engaged in learning. I want to turn now to a very brief um, background of the context leading up to the 1980s reforms. Um, and I'm hoping it's a rollicking summary and will keep you entertained. So I really want to, I'm going to focus on the period that's known in New Zealand policy-wise as the Tomorrow Schools era. Um, however, you know, prior to that time, there is a historical context um, in New Zealand and it's marked by um, I think some quite unique engagements between Māori and settlers. So one of those was basically around literacy. Early literacy was um, arrived in New Zealand with missionaries. And what was special about that literacy is that it was in the Māori language. So that meant there was an orthography for Māori language developed very early. Most of the Gospels were written in Māori language and Māori people became literate in the Māori language very early. They also were biliterate through schooling. So that's sort of one unique thing. Um, the second thing is that Māori actually engaged in schooling, um, in some cases with great enthusiasm. So when the settler government um, sort of implemented a raft of quite devastating legislative changes, of which one was the Native Schools Act. It required communities to actually provide the land for the school, pay for part of the salary of the teacher, collect firewood, and essentially host the teacher in their communities. And there had to be a list of members of the community who supported that school. 
and many of our communities throughout New Zealand established schools. And I'm going to come back and refer to that um, later. However, that was in the 1860s. Also in the 1860s, what was called the New Zealand Settlement Act, which was the act that enabled um, government confiscation of Māori land. Also, the Māori Land Court was established, which ensured the individualisation of land title. So schooling was part of a raft of initiatives, government schooling. And for many politicians, schooling was seen as a way to reconcile, this is a quote, reconcile Māori to the loss of their land. And that was the sort of purpose of state education. Um, having said that, our first university graduates who were Māori graduated from the University of Canterbury at the end of the 19th century. And that was due to the efforts um, of one remarkable principal who refused to actually follow policy. Right? The policy of the time was no um, academic curriculum, that Māori children should be taught manu a manual curriculum and learn to be good farmers. He taught them Latin, Greek, mathematics, and the kind of subjects you needed to matriculate and get admission to university. Uh, he was so successful, government ran an inquiry in 1906 and banned that school and a couple of other schools that were doing that from continuing with that curriculum. So that killed off for many a pathway um, to academic development. So if we turn 100 years later to the early 1970s, there was sort of growing disquiet, uh, Māori disquiet with schools. And more and more, a younger generation of Māori we're seeing schools as deliberately killing off Māori language and culture, of purposefully failing students and treating Māori as second-class citizens. These were sort of seen as symptoms of the lack of recognition of the Treaty of Waitangi. A wide range of protests, land occupations, petitions, a tent embassy which was copied from here, long protest marches from the top of the North Island to Wellington to highlight the loss of Māori land and to support the revitalisation of language occurred during the 1970s. There was a broad consensus leading into the early 1980s across Māori communities, including different generations, different tribal groups, urban and rural communities, that schooling for Māori was in crisis and that schools were failing us. It was a Māori language survey carried out by Richard Benton, which showed the rapid decline of the use of Māori language in our communities and that the younger generations were no longer speaking Māori. He talked of that as language death. And that really was a significant sort of example of you know, in the end of how research was absolutely useful to the community and galvanised the community into action. There was an interesting convergence then of activists, community leaders, and the presence of very senior Māori public servants who agreed that change had to happen. And one of the developments out of this moment came what we call the Māori language nests, or kōhangaru early childhood centres that brought together native speakers of Māori language with young children from, from babies up to six, year, six years old to immerse them in, in Māori as their first language. Two innovative aspects of kōhanga reo were the use of the nest as a substitute for the home and the incorporation of the extended family as the structure of the nest. So just think about mother tongue, when the mothers don't speak Māori. The nest became the means to give the mother tongue to our children. Three generations 
grandparents who were native speakers, parents who did the sort of physical work of the nest, and young children were put together in this immersion environment. Out of that, we then developed an alternative immersion schooling option called Kura Kaupapa Māori. These started to appear in the, 19, in the 18, um, 1987, 1986. Um, I was one of the parents as part of that movement who decided it was a waste of time trying to change existing schools. And it was not that they were ill-intentioned or weren't trying. They just couldn't do the adaptations that we thought were necessary. And so we basically set up schools in um, the school I was attached to was set up in the Teachers College at the University of Auckland, and others were set up in community centres. At the age of six, you were meant to send your children to school, and we deliberately held our children back um, as an act of resistance until the government recognised these schools. We named the schools deliberately as Kurakopapa Māori rather than as bilingual schools. The bilingual education research available at the time was almost completely useless to our case. Most bilingual education for Indigenous students was, a, was designed to take them from their native language to the dominant language of the coloniser, or was designed to hold them in their native language so as to restrict their development, as occurred in South Africa and parts of Latin America, or was about one colonial language e.g. French, trying to coexist with another colonial language, e.g. English, as in Quebec. In this case, the minority language had another home or mothership that could resource the language. The most relevant research in this area, from our perspective, came from the Welsh language initiatives, their bilingual and Welsh immersion schools. The fact that most research was unhelpful either way was a strategic advantage in our political negotiations, but meant we were flying blind in our efforts to start an alternative schooling system. In many awkward meetings, department officials would begin by referring to bilingual education and bilingual research, and we would react by saying that our schools were absolutely not bilingual, but immersion schools based on Māori philosophies and pedagogies and that the research they were cited was irrelevant. We also came to the conclusion that our teachers needed decolonising as well, so we developed an alternative teacher education programme, which is still in place. Simultaneous to our efforts with primary education, a small group of leaders had also established alternative higher education institu institutions known as Waimanga. In the decade of the 1980s, a flurry of Māori-imagined educational in interventions had been established, which preempted the reform of schools that occurred with the Education Amendment Act in 1989. Both Kura Māori and Wānanga were included in the new legislation, and a raft of other programmes were incorporated into our schooling and tertiary institutions. So finally, just in terms of painting, of painting this context and perspective, today most Māori students still attend the conventional mainstream public schools, many of which now also teach Māori uh, medium um, education, some of which is called immersion um, and some more in a sort of bilingual half and half approach, some subjects taught in English, some subjects taught in Māori language. Māori language is the official language of New Zealand, along with deaf language. English is not in the legislation. And New Zealand is crawling its way to probably making Māori language compulsory in the next decade. Private schools also um, teach Māori language, and King's College, probably one of the top private schools in New Zealand, Māori language is compulsory in the curriculum. Our kura kaupapa Māori represent a very small proportion of the total number of Māori students. 
The focus of Māori communities is still the education system as, the ho as a whole, the survival of Māori language, as well as the day-to-day -day experience and success of our students in schools. The government have implemented partnership agreements with tribes and have been in constant negotiation with high peak Māori educational bodies around curriculum, evaluation and assessment. There have been large-scale government-funded interventions into achievement and ensuring that the disparities be between Māori and non-Māori are reduced. Educational outcomes are improving for Māori students, but there's no one particular reason for that. There's also a very nuggety tale um, or proportion of Māori students who still leave school without any school qualifications. So what does this all mean after 30 years of, edu of educational development? So I want to summarise about seven points. Firstly, the consent to be educated. The early initial excitement by Māori in literacy and then in the take-up of schooling is some indicator of a willingness to engage. The formal consent to be educated is found in the Treaty of Waitangi which guaranteed Māori the right to retain cultural knowledge and the legacies of our ancestors, but also the rights as British subjects. Many Māori commentators will argue that being regarded as citizens did not really happen Māori soldiers alongside their European settler contemporaries in Europe. The consent to be educated is partially a collective consent of a people, but it's also a negotiated process of consent. In getting that part right, with schools being challenged to form relationships with Fano or extended families and communities, and having them involved in school governance and the processes of learning. Consent to be educated also implies consent to be treated with, as equals or as treaty partners. It is clear from our educational history that Māori wanted to be educated, but not at the expense of the complete loss of language and culture. The consent that has been negotiated is to be educated as Māori and as a citizen of New Zealand and the world. Secondly, the Māori imaginary. Māori represent a non-romanticised indigenous peoples who have engaged with modernity and the settler state in interesting ways and have sought to be self-defining, self-determining sovereign entities as well as individual subjects in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. This means that Māori do not conform to some pure notion of an you know, untouched native. And the majority of Māori do not wish to be disengaged from society or the world, nor do they wish to return to a 17th century material or indeed political life. Indeed, the goals of Māori development, as framed by Professor Mason Dury, are to live as Māori, to be citizens of the world, and to be well. The Māori imaginary is embedded in the Treaty of Waitangi as a foundational document that defines how New Zealand is to be governed in partnership with Māori. But imagining that public education was the critical means to protect and advance the retention of Māori language, knowledge and culture, and that Māori concepts could be used to design and launch alternative educational visions, institutions, curricula and practices, speaks to a Māori imaginary as a powerful re way to reframe the colonial experience. If schools could be used to destroy us, they could also be used to rebuild us. The Māori imaginary is a counterpoint to the idea of neoliberal indigeneity. 
or neoliberal multiculturalism, which suggests that neoliberalism has reconstituted multiculturalism and indigeneity in ways that have co-opted peoples as neoliberal subjects. I would argue that most of the new Māori innovations and alternative institutions that were created in the 1980s era were designed prior to the market model education reforms of 1989 and actually shaped the reforms in unanticipated ways. Māori concepts provide, provided a paradigmatically different way to critique and engage with neoliberal market reforms. It was not a critique from the left or the right, but from a completely different worldview and moral standpoint. Māori people, for the most part, did not yearn to stay in a pre-neoliberal New Zealand, because it was seen as still dripping in its colonial vestiges and racial privilege and getting worse. So educational reform was seen as an opportunity to provide substance to the rhetoric of school choice and to advance Māori aspirations. A third point, producing a 21st century Māori subject. One of the key arguments at play in the 1980s was around what kind of Māori subject or citizen schools were producing. At that time, the summary was of a Māori subject who was incapable of learning, was ashamed, angry, disconnected from her being, could not speak Māori, was disrespectful of Māori values and ignorant of Māori culture, ignorant of the colonial history of New Zealand, was a living caricature of Māori identity, was destined for manual work and to live a half-life as a brown white person. Educational reforms were based on producing what has been referred to as the neoliberal subject, an autonomous competitive individual able to pursue self-interest without constraints in a global marketplace. Education was a private good that helped individuals accumulate private capital. Cultural diversity was considered good because it diversified the market and di differentiated some of its products, but was essentially seen as part of a commodity as anything else. In this rather stark vision, community or society became less important, and parents as a specific social category became more accountable for educational decisions. Failing was seen as the result of poor choices by parents, and the consequences of those poor choices were of their own making, and therefore did not warrant any state support. Māori aspirations were, and still are to a great extent, of a Māori subject who could speak Māori and English, was connected to their culture, values and histories, who was also educationally successful and materially independent from the state, who could provide cultural leadership, who was respected by their community, who could make a contribution to intergenerational transformation and who had good health, a home, and a happy extended family. In this vision, the concept of whānau or extended family and vision was an important point of contention, and in submissions by Māori communities in the reform process, Māori language and whānau were the two ideas that Māori were adamant had to be accommodated in the reforms. They were organising principles that enabled Māori to resist the aspects of reform seen as hostile. They were able to co-opt those discourses of reform, such as school choice, to point out that Māori had no choices, and were able to compromise on other aspects of reform, which were already seen um, as lost. My fourth point, the wider reform agenda in New Zealand. The neoliberal reforms in New Zealand, which included the privatisation of industries such as forestry, had an immediate impact on the Māori economy. Their attempts to mask unemployment by changing categories of people who were out of work, 
Um, but at one point, more than a third of Māori men were out of work, and a quarter of Māori women were out of work. There was an interesting change of discourse in that once a strong workforce who had high levels of employment were suddenly seen as not willing to work, as no hopers, and as dull blood and as dull bludgers, bludgers. The 1990s were difficult in many of our communities. The search for work decimated them as adults fanned out to urban areas and here to Australia to seek work. The stripping down of the Ministry of Education into a policy ministry rather than an operational department uh, so that there were no advisors and no support systems stranded schools and stranded communities and left them without support. The promise of school choice in country areas added strain on existing small schools to provide diverse streams of schooling options, including Māori language education. Boards of trustees struggled to manage school as intended. And while critics had pointed out that schools in wealthy communities will do even better under the new rules, and that schools in poorer areas would struggle, the ideology of the model was clung to for many years by politicians and educational administrators. The ministry was reluctant to intervene and only did so when it looked like whole regions of self-managing schools were in trouble. For a period through the 1990s, many of our smaller communities and their schools got lost in a dogged adherence to an ideological model that never quite worked as intended. In terms of competition and the role of the market and parent choice, some schools theoretically should have simply died as parents moved away and chose better schools. Small communities only had one school, but the message to parents was that they could redesign it to meet their aspirations. This was divisive in small communities, and the dividing line in Māori communities was around Māori language education. This lateral community struggle over Māori language within, within our communities was sometimes framed as a struggle not over language, but about education. The argument being that there were more resources and better opportunities to learn in English than there were in Māori. In some communities, a competing school was established, either on the same grounds or just down the road. This then split families and split community capacity. Communities fought for their schools. Many parents had no means to go, no, no means to go elsewhere, and many chose to support their school because they thought that option was still better than choosing a school in another community. Government initiatives, which are still at play as I speak, subsequently engineered mergers, closures, and other means to terminate what they saw as poor performing schools. One of the key stress points in terms of Māori language education was the lack of supply of teachers who were qualified and who could speak Māori. Kura Kaupapa Māori in this period uh, were already well organised to self-manage, as the first cohort of schools had already existed as independent alternative schools prior to the reforms. However, governance for most schools was still a challenge, and for schools and communities that had no access to parents with professional expertise, there was a huge struggle um, to manage the compliance of self-managing schools. My fifth point, community resilience, the death of hope and the importance of capacity building. I've written elsewhere of the experience I once had in the 1990s of returning to my own tribal area to work with the local communities and their schools. My tribe, we all like to think our tribe is the best and most proudest tribe in the country, and my tribe is. And one of our distinguishing features 
is we are one of the few tribes in which women can speak in all formal rituals. But it is a rural area, a farming area on the east coast of the North Island. I arrived in my community as a consultant to the Ministry of Education. One of my tasks was to take a community group through a visioning exercise so that they could consult the wider community about their aspirations and visions for schools. The exercise started tentatively, and at some point a parent put her hand up and asked, is it all right if our vision is that our children could learn to read? It broke my heart. It got worse. I returned a few weeks later after they had consulted with their communities and the feedback was even more depressing. I was outraged but suggested that they try again but this time work with families including the children. When I returned the group participants were bubbling with joy. Thankfully the children's visions had not only reached for the sun and the moon but had moved the parents into a different imaginative space to talk about education. After that experience, I paid deeper attention to what was happening in the community and in other communities around New Zealand. Communities are resilient to a point, then they break. They can respond to crises. They can function as a collective. They can absorb tragedy. They can pick up the pieces. There are many examples of community resilience as a form of glue that is sticky enough to hold fractured pieces together for a time. But add on to these communities, intergenerational trauma, multiple crises sustained over decades, deep material impoverishment that is exploited by drugs and dependent on an illegal economy of drugs for basic commodities. Add in the code of silence that is enforced around drugs, the domestic violence and undercurrent of violence. Add the lack of secure employment and flow of money through the community. Add on the fact that most people have poor health, have hardly any access to dental health care unless the army comes or the Otago Dental School visits. Add on one main road that is mostly sealed that still floods during the winter. And people from government services who deliver drive-by services because their offices have moved to the, service, to the city. Add on a large group of elderly people living alone, mostly women, who have lived in these communities for years and stubbornly intend to stay there until they die. Then subtract from the community the departure of younger adults and families who value education. Subtract the stable leadership that is now elderly and seen as too old to be effective. Subtract some of the community experts and traditional knowledge and practices. Empty out entire houses. Subtract the closure of important services like a bank and supermarket. Situate this picture in a remote place where if you have a serious accident, you need a helicopter to get into your valley because the road be, could be closed, or the ambulance is, relu is reluctant to come unless they have backup. That's a sanitised snapshot of some of the communities I come from. So communities are resilient to a point, and then there is a zone where resilience collapses and hope is defeated. It is not a good place. Let me draw this out a bit. Community resilience breaks down when neighbours and families and the most vulnerable are abandoned or left to their own devices. It breaks down when trust becomes eroded as people steal from their own families, when community lies become taken as truths and bullies take over the caring services. Hope is defeated because it becomes pointless as there seems to be no end in sight, no possibility of change, all roads out are blocked by powerful forces, some visible and known, others more threatening spectres lurking around the corner. In this context, schools, if there is still one open, play a hugely significant role. 
not as beacons of hope, but as the critical route out of the situation. It is the long-range investment in community change as it prepares the next generation and the generation after that. Education is the most important means of advancement for individuals and for the development and resiliency in our communities. Schools help to build community capacity through parental, and um, parental involvement, shared governance, and participation in the organising of community events. But schools also need communities to have some capacity, to have moral and social leadership, and the means to operate, even as a small community, that can come together. It is why community leadership is important. In his book called Radical Hope, Jonathan Lear argues for a kind of ethical leadership that can make courageous decisions when a people are faced with cultural devastation. The example he uses was of a leader called Plenty Coops, a Native American tribal leader, who after being defeated, set his people free to create new lives to live again. I see that idea as an opportunity to create new visions of community and to reimagine culture. The kind of educational programs we run in higher education are, in my view, about preparing that level of capacity for communities. It is a leadership that combines intellectual and cultural abilities that can provide resources that inform communities and lift the internal quality of leadership and capacity. My sixth point is the role of educational thought and research in this context. As mentioned earlier, educational ideas have been of mixed usefulness to the development of many of our Māori initiatives. Our work in deconstructing many aspects of schooling in order to create the kind of school we wanted meant we tried out many ideas that had been discarded by the establishment. Our context, however, was different, and we were driven by some practical, real constraints, as well as a desire to search for strategies and ideas that could be applied immediately and that delivered results quickly. Some examples of these ideas that we return to are, firstly, phonics and whole language. New Zealand is known for its whole language approach, whole language approach to reading. In other words, reading meaningful, meaningful texts for meaning. We used a phonics-based system to teach our children reading in Māori. Māori is a very phonetic language with consistency of sounds, and phonics was useful in providing initial word attack skills. There was also a lack of graded reading books in Māori, so trying to choose texts was impossible. Many books written in Māori at the time were written to be read aloud by an adult rather than being written for the purpose of teaching reading. Our educational colleagues, some of whom very famously created and argued for whole language, were somewhat horrified. We thought it was all very well in English medium schools um, which were privileged through having numerous meaningful texts on one hand for instruction as well as supplementary reinforcement to focus on whole language. We had no such texts and we had a language that lent itself to meaningful chunks of sound. Rapid mastery of the sound system and word recognition led to successful reading. Secondly, mathematics and set theory New Zealand taught mathematics through understanding sets, moving very quickly from concrete um, strategies or the use of concrete um, resources to more abstract work in the primary years. Our schools lacked good math specialists and none of the textbooks were written in Māori. By chance, a visiting Japanese, Japanese abacus specialist came and started to teach the abacus. He could not speak English or Māori, and the children could not speak Japanese, and we did not find that a problem. He taught abacus 
In one of our schools, the students became really good at calculations and moved quickly into learning fractions. We were told that that was not a curriculum requirement. My third example, science is science, and science alongside indigenous knowledge. Initially, our schools taught no formal science, and we struggled to find resources to support a science curriculum. There was serious debate about whether we should in fact teach science or teach a combined indigenous knowledge and science curriculum focusing on the environment. In one of our schools, we decided to teach science through the medium of English language in a classroom off to the side of the school. They were taught basic biology and chemistry. By basic, I meant they were taught how to make yogurt. They had a separate curriculum uh, subject taught in Māori language that concentrated on indigenous knowledge and the environment. Other schools taught a combined bicultural science curriculum delivered partially in Māori language and drawing on relevant topics. The teaching of science is still a challenge, but not just in Māori language schools, in, in schools more generally. Our experience was driven by finding out what works best for our learners. While we were doing what we, while we were doing that, we were also fending off policy officials who were asking us to tell them at what age we thought it would be no longer necessary to immerse the children in Māori language. They claimed to have research saying that it was, would be about 10 years old, the age of 10. Our response was that at 10 years old, they will speak Māori like a 10-year-old. And we didn't want a bunch of elders who spoke Māori in our ceremonies like 10-year-olds. The research they cited was about the introduction of English, but also about concept, concepts of code switching. Our decision, based on some of that research, was when the children could read well in Māori, had a high quality level of fluency in Māori, and when the child and parents were ready. It varies from school to school, but that is still the main policy. In this context, the policy questions were driven by different motivations than the classroom questions or the questions from communities. A programme of research that works with kura communities to co-produce research is starting to support the work that these, school, that these schools do. So some concluding remarks. I think in the Indigenous world, we expect schools and educational institutions to transform colonial history, or, more bluntly, to put right the wrong. We know that there is no silver bullet. To achieve change requires a wider platform of social and economic change, the full capability of institutions and agencies, the full consent and engagement by communities and families. It also requires an obsessive focus on the different moving parts of the whole, I find the notion of assemblage useful here for trying to describe a whole that is a set of sets, each part moving and interacting with other parts in sometimes mysterious ways. The sticky bits vary in terms of context. The whole transforms as the various parts transform. Individuals are also changing. In a more successful vision, the question seeking permission for children to be able to read becomes a question that can imagine another horizon in the distance and slightly out of sight. That's the journey. And while it is long, it can happen within the life of a generation. Thank you.
years ago, uh, Professor Smith's Namoration discussed the importance and relevance of Indigenous knowledge. For those of you who don't know, the Namoration is, of course, apart from the Education Dean's Lecture Series, the most high-profile Indigenous uh, lecture that we have at the university. Uh, Linda talked about the relevance of Indigenous knowledge to the way we live our lives now and the ways our following generations can live their lives. She began with a discussion about how, internationally, Indigenous knowledges are currently conceptualised and discussed, and she raised some critical questions about the implications of those conceptualisations. Professor Smith then discussed points of convergence with recent scholarship before shifting gear to examine the big challenges we face and the ways an Indigenous knowledge approach can help guide us through. This evening, as you heard, Professor Smith has focused her thoughts on education. I'd like to pick up briefly on her third key point, producing the 21st century Māori subject. We can learn many things from across the Tasman, and in particular, a comparative approach to the creation of the 21st century Indigenous subject is one close to my heart. We do have a shared yet distinct uh, experience of uh, colonisation, and we have a shared yet distinct response to the social forces which shape our identities in the 21st century. We know education has a deep and profound effect on how we are shaped and how we see the world and how the world sees us. There is much to learn from your thoughtful uh, uh, critique and analysis. Thank you uh, for sharing your time with us, your insights and your energy uh, with us at the university over the last period of time and continuing your thoughts from two years ago uh, with a greater focus on education. We are most certainly enriched by your engagement. Can you join with me in thanking Professor Linda Tuhiwa-Smith? <laughs> <laughs>